I got this sweet shirt made for my upcoming trip to CrimeCon in September, and I wanted to give a shout out to the lady who made it. If you want to see a bunch of cool, sparkly, bedazzled items, you can check out Cleola Creations. Her Instagram and Etsy ID are below, and links are in the description, so check it out. Thanks. In 2009, light snow littered the tree-lined streets of Manhattan, and just a few minutes away from Central Park, a 47-year-old woman named Shelly Danishevsky Kovlin had just finished celebrating Christmas with her two kids at apartment 515 at 155 West 68th Street on the Upper West Side in New York. Like most other families in Manhattan, Shelly and her family were now getting ready to celebrate New Year's Eve. But unfortunately, Shelly wouldn't get to see the New Year as, on December 31st, 2009, she was found dead in her bathtub at the Dorchester Tower apartment building. The victim was found by her nine-year-old daughter lying face down in a pool of bloody water. After the detectives arrived on the scene, they carried out their initial investigation and, at the end of it all, everything clearly pointed to an accident being the apparent cause of the death. Having come to that conclusion, the case was quickly wrapped up and the victim was soon buried. However, even after the burial of the victim, a few detectives still believed that there was something more to the case than what met the eye. Numerous unanswered questions already surrounded the victim's death, but there was one burning question on the detectives' minds. As they all asked themselves, why was a woman who had just been instructed not to get her hair wet by her hairdresser found dead in the bathtub? It would take these detectives a decade-long investigation, but they would eventually uncover the truth about what had happened and realize that it wasn't an accident. This is Monsters. The case begins in 1998, at a Jewish singles party in a bar called Le Bar Bat. This bar was located in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of Manhattan. It was February at the time, and then 36-year-old Shelly Danishevsky was attending the Jewish singles party. She was a marketing graduate who had built a successful career for herself. She had a great job and a nice apartment. All that was missing for the successful businesswoman was the perfect man. Luckily for Shelly, she'd soon lay eyes on the man of her dreams, and it was then 25-year-old Roderick Kovlin. For the couple, it was more than love at first sight. A few hours after they met, Shelly called her sister Eve to tell her she was now on her way to Las Vegas because she wanted to marry Rod. Eve managed to talk her sister out of the impulsive decision, but the fairy tale love the couple felt for each other grew overnight, and just a few weeks after that, they were engaged. The 11-year age difference didn't matter to either of them as they were already deeply smitten. Rod wanted his parents to meet Shelly, and Shelly constantly told her sister how amazing Rod was. It wasn't long before they finally did get married as the pair tied the knot in September of 1998. Two years after their wedding, the couple had their first child, a girl named Anna. Things went perfectly for their little family at first as the couple were still very much inseparable during the early years of their marriage. Shelley had grown up in a very traditional Orthodox household, so she was a devout woman of the Jewish faith. Their shared Jewish religion, coupled with Shelley's religious upbringing, led the family to be very active within the Jewish community and at their local synagogue while they raised Anna. Rod and Shelley were very happy with each other for the first few years, but as the honeymoon period slowly passed, the couple soon realized that they were very different people. Shelley was a very hard-working woman. She worked at UBS as a senior vice president for private wealth management, while Rod, on the other hand, was a failed stockbroker. Instead of chasing a fruitful career, Rod decided to live off his wife's money, as he put little to no effort into finding employment. Even when Rod managed to get a job, he struggled to keep it for long. He sometimes tried his luck in a couple of financial ventures that Shelley funded with her own money, but none of them ever came to fruition. Shelley was willing to overlook all that as she still loved Rod, but with all the free time on his hands, she soon noticed her husband had developed an obsessive passion for backgammon gambling. 
Rod believed he was a pro backgammon player, and after winning a few games, he decided to make a career out of it. He usually took long trips around the country for his backgammon tournaments. When Rod wasn't traveling for backgammon, he would spend hours on end playing the game online. He loved the game so much that he would often stay up all night just so he could compete in various tournaments online. Rod's backgammon obsession came with a slew of other issues, as when Rod wasn't playing the game, he was spending his time incessantly chasing other women online. He would often look for women on dating sites and social media platforms, as Rod once contacted over 40 women on Facebook in a single day. Most of the women Rod chased online were the ones he met during his tournament trips or while playing backgammon online. In addition to that, Rod would also go after the women he met at the New York City backgammon group. At this point, it seemed like Rod loved the game more than he loved Shelly, and even though everyone around him was against it, Rod showed no signs of stopping. Things got a bit unbearable for Shelly during that time, as in addition to his backgammon obsession, Rod started having sudden outbursts of anger, which led Shelly to believe he was bipolar. To make matters worse, Shelly, who was pregnant with twins at the time, gave birth prematurely and she unfortunately lost both babies, as one died in the womb while the other died after birth. Shelly was then told that she wouldn't be able to conceive again, so in 2006, the couple had to resort to an egg donor to have their second child, a boy named Miles. Rod never let Shelly forget that they had to use an egg donor to get their son, and he would later go as far as telling the child that Shelly wasn't his biological mother. By the time their 10th anniversary arrived, the couple's marriage was already damaged beyond repair, but Rod, who claimed he still loved Shelly, decided to put the final nail in the coffin by asking her for an open marriage. Shelly was completely disgusted by Rod's proposition, so she immediately rejected it, but Rod didn't care as he continued his streak of infidelity. He decided to take things up a notch as he joined J-Date, a Jewish dating service under the fake name James Early. If you're trying to attract women, I don't know why you'd pick the name Early. Rod would meet countless women on the site, and he soon started juggling more than two dozen prospective lovers at a time. Shelly had already uncovered Rod's infidelities after seeing an email from one of his lovers and it seemed like he wasn't trying to hide his affairs anymore as he came home one morning smelling of another woman's perfume. By January of 2009, Shelly was completely fed up with Rod's maltreatment and his crude behavior. She wrote numerous emails to her sister Eve telling her how it had been a nightmare living with Rod due to his uncontrollable anger and repeated cheating. In one of those emails, Shelly sent a message that read, quote, I'm very scared that at some point in the future, all his anger and rage may result in something bad happening. He really can't control his temper. Shelly had already confronted Rod about his unfaithfulness that month, and he proudly admitted to cheating on her. That was the final breaking point in their marriage, as the couple stopped living together in April of 2009. Shelly, who didn't want their growing issues to affect the children, leased an apartment across the hall for Rod to move into so that the children could always have access to their father. She also gave him keys to her apartment that he could use to enter and see the children anytime she was at home. They both tried to make things work with that arrangement as they planned a family outing to the botanical gardens on Mother's Day with the children, but the day ended in tears and arguments when Rod viciously insulted Shelly for not being respectful to his mother. Shelly, who was frightened by the way Rod spoke to her, immediately texted Eve, sending her a message that read, quote, Shits hit the fan, before telling her that Rod was now forcefully moving his stuff back into her apartment. That same week, Shelly had a physical confrontation with Rod in front of the children's nanny, and she finally filed for divorce by the end of the week. After 11 long years of marriage, the couple had now decided to part ways. Rod moved back into his apartment across the hall to make the transition easier for the children, and they both moved on with their lives. It didn't take long for Shelly to pick herself up as she continued with her successful career at UBS. She also started dipping her toe into the dating pool again as she joined the J-Date website and met new suitors. Shelly was thriving in both her personal and professional lives, but Rod, on the other hand, wasn't doing so well. Without his wife funding his backgammon gambling and his other frivolous passions, Rod knew it was only a matter of time before he wouldn't be able to keep up with his lifestyle. 
It also didn't sit right with him that his ex-wife was moving on quickly. Angered that Shelley was flourishing post-divorce and doing so well without him, Rod decided to make Shelley's life a living hell. He would often break into her apartment every time she wasn't home and he would snoop around on her phone. Rod also placed a form of spyware called a keystroke logger on Shelley's computer that allowed him to monitor all her emails and messages. He also set up a couple of cameras in the hallway so he could see when Shelley arrived and left her apartment. The constant invasion of her private life eventually got to Shelley as she would later complain to her closest friends that she felt like Rod was stalking her and watching her every move. Because he was. Rod's harassment only went up from there as he tried to sabotage her job at UBS by complaining to John Alex, Shelley's boss. Rod made outrageous claims as he told John that Shelley was using drugs and that she was also draining their joint checking account and ruining him financially. John knew these were all lies as Shelley had recently passed a drug screening test and after reviewing the joint checking account, he saw that Shelley had only taken out $800 and Rod, who claimed she was draining the joint account, had withdrawn $7,200. With his failed attempt to discredit Shelley at her job, Rod decided to do something even more sinister. On July 8, 2009, Rod, who had unrestricted visitation access, took the kids from their mother's apartment. But when Rod was supposed to return the children at 8 p.m. that night, he was nowhere to be found. A distraught Shelley frantically called and texted Rod, but he didn't answer, so with no other option, she decided to call the cops. Officer Crystal Vargas arrived at Shelley's apartment that night to see her sobbing uncontrollably. Officer Vargas later recalled the incident, saying, quote, She threw herself into my arms, hugging me, and began to weep uncontrollably. She was pale, and I remember her staring at me and just crying and shaking. She was terrified and kept saying, Oh my god, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. As Shelley was losing her mind wondering where her kids were, Rod had taken their two-year-old son to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital to report his mother for sexual abuse. Rod claimed Miles had told him that his mother had touched him inappropriately on his genitals and bottom. These bizarre claims were all lies, as Rod had spent the last few hours coaching his son to say those horrible things. Luckily, the doctors and administration for child services saw through the horrid scheme as they ultimately determined the abuse allegations were false. An ACS employee interviewed Miles and Rod at the hospital, and after finding no evidence of sexual abuse, she returned the children to their mother the next morning at around 5.30 a.m., Rod stuck with his fabricated story even after the doctors and the ACS agents said it was false, and he later had an interview with the NYPD's Special Victims Unit to follow up on the made-up abuse case against Shelley. The interview took place on July 13, 2009 at the Manhattan Child Advocacy Center office at around 4.45 p.m. He was interviewed by Detective Shirley Figueroa. She later recalled the interview with Rod saying, quote, the complaint had been made against Shelley Kovlin by her ex-husband, Mr. Rod Kovlin, who claimed he had been told by his son of an impropriety committed against him by his mother. During the interview, Mr. Kovlin looked to be in a rush as he told me he had another appointment in Westchester County. I apologized to Mr. Kovlin for any inconvenience and we proceeded to discuss Mr. Kovlin's family life. Mr. Kovlin said that he was separating from his wife and that there had been instances of violence committed by Shelly Danishevsky Kovlin against him. He also said he believed his wife was taking his prescription medication. Mr. Kovlin then acknowledged that he had cheated on his wife before saying he believed his wife was already going to leave him. I attempted to cut Mr. Kovlin off and focus his attention on the allegations concerning his son. Mr. Kovlin then proceeded to discuss the allegations supposedly by his son. The interview with Mr. Kovlin lasted approximately 40 minutes. After our meeting, I thanked Mr. Kovlin for coming in and he left the office. At the end of the investigation, Detective Figueroa came to the same conclusion as the doctors and the ACS agents. There was absolutely no evidence that Miles had been abused by his mother, so the case was closed. Rod's costly lie ended up backfiring on him as the stunt outraged the family court judge who was handling the couple's divorce case. 
the judge restricted Rod's visitation privileges before telling him that all his visits with the children had to be supervised from now on. She then ordered the now unemployed Rod, who had just been fired from his last job for constantly playing online backgammon at work and for taking a lot of time off following the backgammon tour, to turn over $425 in child support to Shelley. Rod's plans had been foiled again and things got even worse for him in the following months as the couple's custody and divorce battle slowly turned into a resentful and spiteful fight. Rod, who had lost another job at a financial consulting firm called Pragma Securities, told the family court judge that he could no longer afford to pay child support. Due to his inability to pay, the judge forbade him from spending money to attend backgammon tournaments. Rod's hatred for Shelley grew to greater heights after he had been barred from using money to attend his beloved backgammon tournaments. Things soon got violent as during an argument between the couple that week, Rod choked Shelley by putting his arm around her neck while screaming, quote, I'll fucking kill you. After the violent dispute, an extremely terrified Shelley quickly took the necessary steps to completely remove Rod from her life. She started by changing the locks on her apartment door to keep Rod out of her house before obtaining an order of protection in favor of her and her kids. Then, on December 29, 2009, Shelley took the final step that would entirely cut her ex-husband from her life. She emailed her trust and estate attorney Lance Meyer that morning with a plan to remove Rod's name from her will. The pair then made plans to cut him out of the will on December 31st. After the meeting was set, Shelley spent December 30th with her hairdresser. The woman came to Shelley's apartment to give her a keratin hair treatment that straightens hair. She then advised Shelley to keep her hair away from water for at least 72 hours, as the treatment would come undone if she wet her hair over the next few days. After that, the kids came home and Shelley left them with the babysitter as she was going on a date with a man she'd met on J-Date. When the date was over, Shelley made her way back home and she got to her apartment by 7.51 p.m. She then spent her evening playing with the children before putting them to bed. Shelley then logged on to her J-Date profile at 10.13 p.m., and after spending a few minutes online, she logged off of the website. As she went to bed that night, she anxiously looked forward to closing the chapter on her ex-husband at her meeting tomorrow, and she couldn't wait to celebrate New Year's Eve with her children. It was 7 a.m. on New Year's Eve, and nine-year-old Anna had just woken up. She went to her mother's room to wake her up, but she didn't see her there. The little girl made her way to the bathroom, and after opening the door, she'd screamed, as she had just found her mother laying face down in the bathtub filled with blood-stained water. The girl immediately called her father, and he rushed to the scene. After his daughter let him into the apartment, Rod removed Shelley from the tub. He then called 911 before performing CPR on her motionless body, and it didn't take long for the first responders to show up on the scene. Officer William Irvin was one of the first officers to arrive, and he later recalled the incident, saying, quote, I was the driver on duty on December 31, 2009, with Officer Pagano on uniformed patrol. At approximately 7.15 a.m., we received a radio communication that a female needed CPR at 155 West 68th Street in apartment 515. When I arrived at the scene, I was told by EMS workers that the deceased was in the rear bathroom of the apartment. I proceeded to look in the bathroom and I saw the deceased, who appeared to be in rigor mortis, covered with a blanket and a towel. I noticed that the bathtub water was brown from being mixed with blood. Also present in the apartment was Mr. Roderick Kovlin, who identified himself to me as the deceased's husband. Anna Kovlin was in the living room of the apartment, but I did not see Mr. Kovlin's son. I asked Mr. Kovlin what happened because he had been the first adult to have contact with the deceased's body. I was then informed that the deceased's daughter discovered the body of her mother in the bathtub. Anna called her father, Mr. Kovlin, who was led into the apartment by Anna. At the time, Mr. Kovlin lived across the hall in apartment 510. After he got into the apartment, Mr. Kovlin removed the body from the bathtub and tried to perform CPR. When that didn't work, he placed the children in one of the bedrooms and called 911. Mr. Kovlin also said that the body was cold, so he covered it with a blanket. During our interaction, I noticed Mr. Kovlin was stone-faced, his statements were short, and he did not maintain eye contact. 
Detectives arrived at the scene shortly after Rod had talked to Officer Irwin. The detectives at the apartment were Detective Carl Roa Darmel and Detective Robert Mooney. They were escorted to the bathroom where the deceased was found. Rob then told the detectives that he believed Shelley accidentally slipped and fell while taking a bath in the early morning hours. He then pointed out a cabinet above the bathtub that was partially pulled off its hinges, and he said she probably held onto it for support before falling and hitting the back of her head. It seemed like the only plausible explanation at the time, and Detective Roa Darmel recalled the incident saying, quote, There was water on the floor, and she had some blood running from the back of her head. And then there was a set of cabinets above, with doors and hinges, which was partially pulled off. It really looked like she may have tried to grab the shelf as she was falling. Nothing was confirmed yet, but it looked like an unfortunate accident was the reason for the tragedy that happened that morning. With the case essentially solved, the detectives turned their attention to the grieving family. They asked to speak to Anna, who found her, and Rod to ask them a few more questions. One of the last officers to arrive on the scene was Sergeant Yadalyn Sanchez, and she recalled the incident saying, quote, I was on duty on December 31, 2009, driving for Sergeant Mary O'Donnell when we received a call concerning a dead body at 155 West 68th Street. I spoke with Mr. Kovlin, and he repeated the same version of events that he had told the other officers and detectives. Mr. Kovlin then hugged me, stating that he was very upset and could not believe what was happening. I and Sergeant O'Donnell felt sorry for Mr. Kovland, and he was not asked any further questions. After all the necessary questions had been asked and their initial investigation was concluded, the officers and detectives left, and Shelley's family was informed of her death. That same night, Detective Roa Darmel went over the details of the crime scene, and while he believed Shelley's death could have been an accident, a lot of things he saw at the crime scene that morning just didn't sit right with him. For starters, the position of the body and the way the cabinet door was pulled down didn't really align with the slip and fall story that he'd been told. The detective also remembered the victim had bright red scratch marks and bruises on her face, lips, and right arm, and he wondered how she could have gotten those marks from falling in the tub. In addition to that, the detective had just uncovered new information that detailed Shelley's activities the day before her death. He found out about the keratin treatment Shelley had recently done, and he asked himself what she was doing in a bathtub filled with water after being told not to get her hair wet. This question was the start of it all, as Detective Roa Darmel wondered if the victim really fell in the bathtub or if she had been placed there by somebody else. Rod claimed to have pulled Shelley out of the blood-stained water, but his shirt was clean and dry when the first officers arrived, thus contradicting his own statements. The more questions Detective Roa Darmel asked, the more the accident story seemed less believable. And even though most of the investigators already believed Shelley's death was an accident, the detective felt there was something more to this case. He had already taken some pictures of the crime scene, but he didn't perform a full forensic search because he wanted to wait until after the autopsy. He hoped to get more information from the post-mortem examination, as he believed the result would point him in the right direction and tell him what he should be looking for. Unfortunately, the autopsy the detective hoped for didn't happen, as he was informed that Shelley's Orthodox Jewish family had expressed reservations about the autopsy due to their religious beliefs, and they had already waived the post-mortem examination on December 31st. Shelley was then buried within 24 hours of her death in accordance with the Orthodox burial customs. Detective Roe Darmel still had his theories, but there was nothing he could do at that point other than respect the family's wishes, so the case was closed. The news of Shelley's death hit the Danishevskys really hard. One of the people who took it the hardest was her sister Eve, as she wondered how Shelley could have accidentally slipped in the bathtub. And as the family sat for Shiva, the week-long mourning period carried out in the Jewish religion for first-degree relatives, their suspicions began to grow. Just like Detective Roa Darmel, they believed there was something more to Shelley's death. Eve said she was shocked to hear Shelley was found dead in the bathtub, explaining, quote, but Shelley doesn't take baths, she showers. Another close friend of Shelley, Stephanie Goldman, agreed with the statement, saying, quote, Shelley wouldn't even take a short bath. 
The family also knew about the carrot and hair treatment she'd had applied the day before, so they knew Shelly couldn't have been in a bathtub full of water after getting the hair treatment. As they continued talking, one name kept coming up. Unsurprisingly, it was Rod. Eve told everyone about his violent temper and how scared Shelly was of Rod in the last few years of their marriage. Most of Shelly's friends who she'd talked to about the matter also agreed as they'd heard similar stories. Some of Shelly's relatives, who now believed she was murdered, started pushing for an autopsy to be carried out. But a self-proclaimed rabbi, Meyer Weil, who responded to incidents where a Jewish person had died, talked to the family and convinced them to change their minds again. Rabbi Weil had reportedly stopped the autopsy just as the medical examiner wanted to make his first incision, and the rabbi retrieved Shelly's body. In accordance with Jewish law, Rabbi Weil was given uninhibited and unsupervised access to Shelley's apartment so he could remove any blood or blood-stained items. He also worked as a medical supply salesman so he had everything he needed to clean the area. Rabbi Weil recalled the day he cleaned Shelley's apartment, saying, quote, I drained the blood-tinted water from the tub and I moved blood-spattered items into Shelley's bedroom. I then got on my hands and knees and scrubbed the bathroom floor with peroxide to remove any trace of blood. Even after Shelley's burial, many members of her family still believed she was murdered, and their suspicions only grew to greater heights when her death certificate stated the cause of death as undetermined. With every passing day, the details surrounding Shelley's death started to look more and more questionable, and when Shelley's estate attorney, Lance Meyer, finally informed the Danishevskys that Shelley was scheduled to meet him on the day of her death to remove Rod from her will, the entire family firmly believed Rod was the culprit. They all knew that Rod stood to inherit $5.2 million in the event of Shelley's demise while he was still in her will, and at that point, the family had no doubt in their minds that it was him. The Danishevskys immediately took their suspicions to the authorities, telling them to reopen the case and continue the investigation. Detective Roe Darmel and Detective Francis Brennan, who were the lead detectives on the case, told the family that they wouldn't be able to conduct a more thorough investigation as the incident had already been written off as an accident. Due to that, they could not obtain subpoenas or search warrants, and they couldn't move forward with the investigation. The family's only option, which would allow the authorities to continue the investigation, was to order an exhumation of Shelley's body and carry out the autopsy that had been denied earlier. But as stated before, that was against the family's beliefs. The Danishevskys, who were now fed up with the authorities' refusal to start an investigation without carrying out an autopsy, decided to take matters into their own hands, so they hired private investigator Michael Swain. It took a couple of weeks, but the private investigator and the Danishevskys were eventually allowed access to Shelley's apartment. And as the investigator looked around, the major thing that stood out to him was the cabinet that Shelley supposedly held onto while falling. Upon closer inspection, he realized that the screws had been pulled out of the wall, and he knew that the petite built Shelley didn't have the strength or weight to rip the cupboard hinges even while falling. Someone else had to have done it. Michael made a statement on the accidental death theory saying, quote, Was it possible? Sure it was possible, until I actually got into the bathroom myself. I realized how high this cabinet is. I also realized how far away from the tub it is. Michael also found a hand towel but not a bath towel in the bathroom, and he gave his thoughts on that saying, quote, If somebody's coming in to take a bath, I sort of want to see a bath towel someplace. I was convinced this was a staged crime scene. The private investigator's report strengthened the Danishevsky's claim, and they already knew what they had to do to get an official investigation going. So with no other options and against their Jewish beliefs, the family reluctantly agreed for an autopsy to be carried out. It'd been two months since Shelley's death, but the authorities finally got the order of exhumation on March 1st, 2010. The exhumation was then quickly carried out and Shelley's body was examined. Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Jonathan Hayes was the one who carried out Shelley's autopsy, and after the examination, he said he found out Shelley's hyoid bone had been fractured, which was usually a hallmark of strangulation. The revelation proved the family's theories were right, and in April of 2010, Dr. Hayes changed the cause of death from accident to homicide. 
Even though Shelley's death was changed to homicide, the investigators had to wait until July to get a search warrant that allowed them to look through the apartment. The officers had to break the door open, as someone had now filled the apartment's lock with glue. The investigators looked into the tampered lock, but the person responsible for it was never found, and the substance they believed to be glue was never tested. The first thing the officers tried to do after getting into the apartment was to find Shelley's phone. They had already detected a signal coming from the phone, and they brought a Faraday bag, a small pouch that blocks electromagnetic fields, to prevent the phone from being hacked, tracked, or scrambled. They did this in case the main suspect, Rod Kovlin, who was a known computer expert, had put some type of jamming equipment in the apartment to scramble the data. However, no such equipment was found by the officers. As they continued with the search, the officers noticed that the two air vents in the apartment had been tampered with. These vents had already been inspected during an earlier investigation carried out by Detective Brennan. The detective said he removed the pair of air vents to look for equipment, but he didn't find anything. He even looked for scratch marks that would indicate if any equipment had been there and was later removed, but no marks were found. After Detective Brennan's thorough inspection, the vents were put back in place. But when the investigators inspected the vents again, one was removed from the wall and placed on the floor, while the other was partially unscrewed. Similar to the glue, it was never revealed who had tampered with the vents. After the search of the apartment, the investigators focused their attention on the night of the murder as they tried to recreate and gather information from the events of that night. The first person they spoke to was Melissa Fields, one of Shelley's closest friends who had seen her hours before the murder. Melissa recalled their meeting, saying, quote, I saw her that day and sensed something was wrong. She was constantly looking around and over her shoulder, and when I asked her why, she said she felt like her ex was following her. After talking to Melissa, they tried asking Rod where he was that night, but he refused to cooperate with the authorities, so his emails and phone records were checked. Both records revealed Rod often contacted a woman named Deborah Oles, who was based in Jacksonville, North Carolina. She was a married woman with three children, and she'd met Rod through backgammon gambling. The pair had also started an extramarital affair a few months before Shelley's murder. Deborah frequently visited Rod in New York, and there were a few deleted messages and texts between Rod and Deborah on the night of the murder. That same night, Rod had been online with Deborah in his apartment across the hall playing backgammon. They both played until 1.03 a.m. before Rod left to do some work on his backgammon federation. The next time Rod texted Deborah after he left was around 4 a.m., and he told her that he'd gotten no work done on his federation because he'd fallen asleep. Rod was then seen on the Dorchester Tower surveillance camera at 4.13 a.m. going out to get some supplies, and when he returned, he stopped at the building's desk to hand the doorman some Snickers candy bars he'd bought. The doorman of the building would later reveal how he found that very odd, as Rod, who he'd thought was antisocial, had never spoken to him before. Seeing Rod giving the doorman a Snickers bar was very out of character, and that raised a bit of suspicion. After this strange interaction with the doorman, Rod was seen once again on the surveillance camera at 4.23 a.m. He was walking out of the building's elevator and went to buy two two-liter bottles of seltzer. Investigators had put Shelley's approximate time of death around 1.25 to 4.25 a.m., and it suspiciously coincided with the time period when Rod was out of contact with his girlfriend, Deborah. Deborah was questioned, but she didn't give the investigators anything. She claimed Rod was a nice person before assuring the investigators that they didn't have anything to do with the murder. At this point in the investigation, all the evidence they managed to gather against Rod was simply circumstantial. The detectives still didn't have any concrete proof against Rod, and the investigation into Shelley's murder eventually went cold. Due to the detectives' recent findings, Rod, who was in a custody battle with Shelley's brother over their children, was told by the judge that he could never be alone with his kids. So custody of the children was given to Rod's parents, and they were sent to live with their grandparents, David and Carol Kovlin, in Scarsdale, New York. Rod had also been denied access to Shelley's $5 million fortune. It had been placed in a trust while he waited for the outcome of the death suit filed against him in 2011. Rod was told not to make any further claims on the money unless the district attorney's office confirmed he was no longer a suspect in the case or until six years had elapsed. 
With no access to Shelley's money, Rod quickly moved into his parents' house as he knew getting custody of his children was the only way he could access the millions of dollars their mother had left as their inheritance. During his stay with his parents, Rod found himself arguing very often with David and Carol as they found out he was stealing money from the children's college funds. Did you steal from your children? You what? stole before! <laughs> you're stealing their college money. They won't be so. able to get to college by the time you're done with them. And you said you didn't care if they went to college. Why don't you tell Anna that every penny you're spending right now is her money and Miles' money? That Shelly wait, wait. worked Hold on a second, Anna. I'd like you to come here. Hold on a second. Come here, please. Yeah. Because you come, haven't come worked here. five come years. In the 12 Ma, years you, you were married, you, you, never, talking? you never worked. You ne your mother worked her ass off for every penny that he's spending. Let me tell you, the Danishevskis are not wrong. They may be wrong about something, not the money. Miles your mother here, Anna, worked, and worked and worked and worked, and your father sat on his ass doing now. He come refuses here. to get a job. He refuses to get come a here. job. Come here. He's spending your money. Okay. First of all. He's spending your money. Okay. What you are saying now, what you are, what you are saying now, in front of Anna and Miles, okay, will ensure that you never see my children again if you continue, okay? You threatened us with no, your children. No, no, I'm not threatening you. Know I'm telling I went you. To excuse me. House by October first. Okay, evict me. Evict me. I went down for eleven years. Go, go get, go. Fine, file the papers. Eleven years. Evict me. Threaten me with your evict children. Evict me. Evict me. Excuse me. I spent evict me. Evict me. Evict me. Evict you know what, Anna? Excuse me. I spent a million dollars of my money to make sure you didn't go to the Danishevsky. No, you spend a million dollars of Bonnie's money. I owe the money. Ah, you're never going to pay money. that money. I'm going to pay yes, the money. Are. You're I'm never going to pay you. me I'm back. I'm not a Out. deadbeat. Out. You're going to steal okay. from me. Because okay. you're a deadbeat. Okay. You're going to steal from me like you steal from your children. These arguments eventually became very violent as he once slammed his mother head first into a wall and he attacked his father a few weeks later. Rod had taken over $84,000 from his children's college fund, and he was recorded admitting the act during a phone call. I mean, I had to take money out of the like, college so we could go away on weekends and escape from my parents. Rod would use the money he stole to take trips with his girlfriend Deborah for his backgammon tournaments. David and Carol eventually had enough of their son's crude behavior, and they banished both him and Deborah from their house. Angered, Rod tried to break into the house when his parents weren't home. The entire ordeal was filmed, and he can be heard claiming that he was a resident. They changed the lock. They changed the lock? I'm a resident. When Rod was thrown out of his parents' house again, he decided to come up with several heinous plans to kill his parents and get custody of the children and their inheritance. The first thing Rod planned on doing was poisoning his parents with the untraceable poisons ricin and aconite. He had gotten the idea after watching the popular crime TV shows Breaking Bad and Dexter. Rod even drove four miles from his parents' home to the Greenberg Public Library to look into the poisons. He logged into the public computer under the username Out of Town Guest and used it to research the poisons. But after finding out he couldn't easily create these poisons, he decided to use rat poison as he could quickly get his hands on it. Rod planned to use his daughter Anna, who was 12 at the time, to unknowingly put the poisonous sugar in her grandparents' tea. But he later decided against the plan when he realized Anna could be arrested if she was caught. Knowing he couldn't poison his parents, Rod told his daughter to accuse her grandfather of rape. He asked Deborah, who he told all his plans, to tell his daughter things to say that make the rape allegations believable. He even went as far as to tell the little girl to use a foreign object on herself that would simulate signs of rape. But Anna was unwilling to do it, and the plan eventually fell through. A few months after that, Rod came up with another plan to kidnap Anna and take her to Mexico. He planned to pay someone there $10,000 to marry his daughter to emancipate the child from her grandparents. Rod had made a call on the matter to an unidentified person saying, quote, I have a passport for Anna. 
I'm sure for $10,000, there's an 18-year-old who would be willing to marry her, remain married, and obviously not live with her, but like, whatever, and like, sign a prenup or whatever. I'll even hire a Mexican law firm to make sure it's done properly. But just like his other plans, Rod wasn't able to go through with it. This man was so desperate to gain money he didn't work for that he was willing to sell his daughter to a stranger in a foreign country. Real nice Rod. Rod had already cooked up another ghastly plan after he couldn't marry off his daughter, and the plan was to take advantage of the chaos happening during Hurricane Sandy and kill his parents. He explained his plan to Deborah in the car, telling her that since there wouldn't be electricity during the storm, the alarms would be off. He then described how he'd get into the house through a basement window, kill his parents, and set the house on fire before rescuing the children. As for his cover story, Rod said he'd tell the police that he was just passing by when the fire started. Deborah, who was completely baffled at Rod's murderous plan and was apparently the only one of them who had a couple of brain cells, told him that no one would believe the just passing by story and Rod reluctantly abandoned the plan. One of Rod's craziest and final attempts to kill his parents happened when he asked Deborah to drive him to a costume shop in Yonkers. He planned to buy a wig and makeup to disguise himself as, you guessed it, a black man. He would then go up to his parents' house and kill his mother with a deadly karate chop to the throat after she answered the door. I can't even make this stuff up. He had apparently learned the move as a martial arts expert. Rod then told Deborah that he would flee through the yard to the next street where she would be waiting in a getaway car. Deborah didn't want to do it, and after she postponed it a couple of times, Rod moved on to the next plan, and this one was never attempted. As Rod kept on thinking up new and morbid ways to get rid of his parents, he soon found out that the investigators were still looking for something to pin him down. So he hatched a plan to get rid of the heat, and he carried it out by attempting to frame his own daughter. Rod drafted a false murder confession in his daughter's email account so it would look as if it were written by her. The fake email stated Anna had angrily pushed her mother to her death after they had argued earlier that day. This appalling email was later found in the girl's drafts and it read, quote, All of these years I've been so incredibly afraid and guilty about the night my mom died. I lied. She didn't just slip. That day, we got into a fight about her dating, and I was still mad when I went to bed. I heard her go into her room and run a bath, so I went in and argued some more, and she told me to go back to my room. I got so mad that I pushed her, but it couldn't have been that hard. I didn't mean to hurt her, I swear. But she fell, and I heard a terrible noise, and the water started turning red, and I tried to pull her head up, but she remained still. So I took miles, crawled into my bed, and cried myself back to sleep hoping I would wake up to see her right next to me, but when I woke up, she wasn't. So I called Daddy and he tried CPR and all sorts of stuff like that, but it didn't work, at which point he called the police. The plan to frame his daughter for her mother's death had been one of the most disturbing things Rod thought of doing, but luckily, just like his other plans, this attempt was unsuccessful. Even with all of his failures, Rod continued with his madness, and it seemed like there was nothing he wouldn't do at this point. Deborah was also terrified of him, as during one of his angered rants, he warned her to never betray him, saying, quote, If you ever fuck me over, I'll come after you. The pair began growing distant in 2014, and Rod, who had grown tired of her, eventually dumped her. That would turn out to be a costly mistake for Rod, as it didn't take long before the pained Deborah called the police and told them everything she knew. Rod Kovlin was arrested on November 1st, 2015 at the Metro North train station in Scarsdale. The authorities apprehended him around 11 a.m. that Sunday as he was going to his weekly visit with his children at his parents' house. The officers made sure to arrest Rod before he got to the house as they didn't want the children to witness the arrest. An unnamed officer recalled Rod's reaction to the arrest, saying, quote, He was totally stunned. He wasn't expecting this at all, and I remember he had a blank stare on his face. It had taken them nearly six years, but they had finally gathered enough evidence to arrest and charge him. Ironically, Rod's arrest happened just two months before the six-year wait that would allow him to finally get his hands on Shelley's money. Rod's arrest was all thanks to Deborah, who told investigators that Rod planned to kill Shelley to gain custody of the children. 
the damning statements weren't the only thing Deborah gave to the police, as she also brought numerous hard drives filled with data and messages from Rod's electronic devices. All this was enough to charge Rod with second-degree murder, and when he was arraigned on felony murder charges in the Manhattan Criminal Court, Rod only uttered two words, not guilty. It would take an additional three years before his trial finally began in 2019. A jury made up of five men and seven women heard weeks of testimony on Shelley's murder at the Manhattan Supreme Court. Everything from dimmed recollections to evasive answers, investigative foibles, and evidence of family interference were revealed in court. The lead prosecutor, Matthew Bogdanos, gave his opening statement at the trial by saying, quote, The question was never, is he going to kill Shelley? The question was always, when? A lot of witnesses had been called by the prosecutors to testify, everyone from first responders to the detectives on the scene. Shelley's boss, John Alex, Rabbi Meyer Weil, and Shelley's family and friends all took the stand. Among many family members who gave statements, Shelley's sister Eve took the stand and gave an emotional statement that she'd written earlier. I still can't believe Shelley's gone. I have recurring nightmares about her final moments as he squeezed that last breath out of her. The helplessness that she must have felt, along with panic and terror, knowing death was imminent, despite her valiant effort to fight back. I carry around my own feelings of guilt, or survival guilt. Shelley confided in me about the many details of his brutality, physical and psychological abuse of both she and the children. I tried to comfort and assure her that I would always be there for her. Clearly, I was wrong. I ask myself those painful questions which there are no answers. Why didn't I do more to protect her? Why didn't I help her find another apartment? Why didn't I try and stop her from signing his lease to the apartment across the hall? I pray that time will help ease the pain and provide some answers. While they admitted that their case was largely based on circumstantial evidence, Prosecutor Bogdanos argued that Rod Kovlin was the only person who had motive to kill Shelley. They believed Rod strangled her to death because he wanted to inherit her fortune, then staged the crime scene to look like an accidental drowning. Prosecutor Bogdanos emphasized that as he told jurors, quote, his primary motive was pure, unadulterated greed. One of their key witnesses was Patricia Swenson, a former girlfriend of Rod whom he had traveled to Pennsylvania with in August of 2009. Patricia took the stand and told jurors how Rod went into a rage when talking about Shelley during that trip, even telling her how he wanted to kill his wife. Patricia recalled Rod's statement, saying, quote, He wanted her dead. His face, his eyes, they were getting glassy like he was getting psychotic. The Kovalin's nanny, Rose Reed, also took the stand, and she went into detail about the physical confrontation that happened between Rod and Shelley. She said to me, said, Rod, throw her down on the floor. And when he asked her to go into the bedroom, she said she was scared of going in there with him because she don't know what he'll do. It wasn't long after that before the star witness, Deborah Oles, took the stand and told jurors everything about Rod, from his morbid confessions to his devious plans to murder his parents. She also went into detail on his plans during Hurricane Sandy. Because there was no electricity, the alarms, the alarm would not be on. He wanted to go through a window in the basement, kill his parents, set his, and set his house on fire. The prosecutors then brought up the injuries found on Shelley's body as Bogdanos told the jurors she had suffered abrasions to her face, hemorrhaging of her right eye, bruising and cuts on her lips, and the dislocation of two ribs. They believed Rod, who had a black belt in Taekwondo, used a martial arts hold to snap her neck. The prosecutors had also gotten their hands on an incriminating video that showed Rod demonstrating the aforementioned chokehold to another inmate during his time awaiting trial at the Brooklyn Detention Complex. In addition to that, the prosecutors kept emphasis on the keratin hair treatment Shelley had gotten the day before, as they assured the jurors that she wouldn't have entered the bathtub of her own free will after getting the treatment. The media donned this part of the trial as the illegally blonde moment due to its similarities with the movie. 
As the trial went on, the prosecutors kept revealing more and more horrific details about Rod and the case. As Prosecutor Bogdanos tried his best to show the jurors just how evil Rod truly was. After all the heinous statements had been made by the prosecutors, Rod's defense lawyer, Robert Gottlieb, told the jurors, quote, You may despise him. You may detest him. You may be offended by his character. But that doesn't make him guilty. Gottlieb kept reminding the jurors that the entire case was based on circumstantial evidence from a bungled police investigation. He argued that there wasn't enough evidence to ever know whether Shelley's tragic death was an accident or a murder. Gottlieb emphasized that, saying, quote, In a circumstantial case, every strand becomes important. Based on the most disgraceful investigation I have ever seen, this jury cannot possibly answer the question of what happened. He also contradicted Dr. Hay's autopsy result as he told the jurors that the hyoid bone could have been broken during the exhumation. During the witness statements, Gottlieb called Deborah a habitual liar before telling juries that her statement was that of a scorned woman. No witnesses were brought to speak for Rod during the trial. However, Rod's mother, who sat behind him through it all, read an emotional letter written by the then 19-year-old Anna, who still believed Rod was innocent. As the trial came to a close, the defense kept trying to counter every argument made by the prosecutors, but no matter how hard Robert Gottlieb tried to make Rod look innocent, the jurors just weren't convinced. And after an eight-week trial, Roderick Kovlin was found guilty of Shelley Kovlin's murder. Before Rod was sentenced, his then 12-year-old son Miles begged Judge Ruth Pickholtz for a lighter sentence for his father, saying, quote, Please give him a light sentence so I have him back in my life. I love him so much. On April 10, 2019, Rod Kovlin was sentenced to 25 years to life for the murder of his wife. The judge pointed out the overwhelming evidence as the reason for giving him the maximum sentence. Robert Gottlieb later appealed the sentence, but the appeal was rejected. Even after the rejection of appeal, Anna wrote another letter to the district attorney, still maintaining her support for her father and her belief of his innocence. Rod Kovlin is currently serving his time in Attica Correctional Facility, New York, and to this day he still claims he had nothing to do with Shelley's death. Which he always will, because just like many other monsters, Rod Kovlin isn't able to tell the truth. He will always believe that he can somehow weasel his way out of answering for his actions. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.